Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we discuss wardrobe maintenance essential and the 10 things you need to protect your wardrobe investment. If you're into a classic men's wardrobe, you can invest an unlimited amount of money into it. But if you do so, you want to protect your investment. Over the course of 18 years, I've learned a thing or two about maintaining a wardrobe. And in this video, I'm going to share my 10 tips to keep your wardrobe in the best shape possible. For example, the jacket I'm wearing here right now is vintage. It's a Augusto Caraceni from Mario Caraceni in Milan. And it's old, but I kept it in great shape without having to bring it to the dry cleaner because I brushed it properly, I had it on the right hangers, and I stored it in a closet and in garment bags. So without further ado, let's start with number one, closet organization. A functioning closet is the base of your wardrobe because if it works, you have the right height of your hangers, you organize it in a way that nothing gets lost and that you maximize the space that you get out of it. Of course, a custom closet is the holy grail and what every clothes horse wants. However, it's quite expensive and you also need the necessary space. If that's not possible, today, fortunately, you have lots of different options, including things like Alpha or even Ikea, which has this pack system, which is quite unaffordable, but customizable. And so you can get exactly the items you want for your pocket squares, for your ties, for your shoes, and for your jackets. You get an organized overview of everything you have in your inventory without wasting anything. So in essence, I strongly advise you to go with a customizable system because most standard wardrobes are not made for a classic men's wardrobe. They have bars in awkward places. And for example, I put my bars on the very top because I didn't want to have that extra space on top to store things because that's very hard to reach. And since I'm tall, I can get out my hangers from the top without any problem, but I wanted my storage space in the middle because that's where I had my pocket squares and I wanted to have them visibly right in front of my eye. If you're thinking about a custom closet, there are hundreds of companies out there, but if you know exactly what you want, it may be a good idea to talk to a local carpenter because they may give you a better quality at a lower price especially if you have an old house that is not standard and conforming to what current closet companies offer. Number two is quality hangers. I urge you to invest in good hangers with a wide shoulder pad because it protects your jacket shoulder. So you can wear a jacket for 30, 40 years without having any issues. On top of that, a sturdy felted trouser bar prevents trousers from sliding down. And if you have enough space, you can even double or triple up your pants in case you have more pants than jackets. Note this trouser bar is also of a much thicker or bigger diameter than a normal trouser bar. And because of that, you don't get a visible crease or wrinkle when you store it even for years. You go with the wire hangers you get from your dry cleaner or thinner plastic hangers. You may be able to squeeze more garments into your closet or your wardrobe. However, you'll get wrinkles and it will destroy your jacket over time. If you invest money in high quality clothes, you don't want to skimp on your hanger because it's so inexpensive comparatively that it would be a waste of your expensive suit or jacket. My favorite hangers come from Butler Luxury. I've tested quite a few, including American brands, Italian brands, German brands, and it's my go-to hanger because it's sturdy. It's made out of two pieces of wood. It has a wide shoulder that is not too wide. So I get enough hangers into my closet. And overall, these hangers have protected my wardrobe over the years. They come in different finishes, including gold and silver and different varnishes of the wood. They're also matte and not shiny, which I really like. And so you can choose something that works with your wardrobe. That being said, if you have 30 suits, it's quite an investment. If you can only afford a few hangers at the time, I suggest to go with your suits and your jackets and then your pants. Of course, you can go with suit hangers or they also have a suit hanger with a dowel bar. And if you have a lot of trousers, I would go with that. If wooden hangers are too expensive for you, you can also sometimes find more inexpensive plastic hangers or sometimes even from brands at department stores that are quite wide. So I would start with those because a thicker plastic hanger is better than a thin wooden hanger. When it comes to shirts, you should definitely go with a thinner hanger. Um, personally, I have some that match my suit hangers, so it's all consistent, but you could go with plastic 
or something really thin like even wire would work. However, with wire, sometimes it oxidizes and it comes and rubs off on the shirt. So I personally stay clear of that. Three, invest into a good iron and even more importantly, an ironing board. Not all irons are alike. Most people can afford a regular steam iron. It's a consumer grade, but it has a good amount of steam holes and you have to refill the water on top and that helps to release wrinkles, whether it's in your shirts or your suits. They also come with a handy temperature adjustment depending on the material your garments are made of. It's important that you have a steam iron that's very powerful because ultimately that's what releases the wrinkles and even at a lower temperature, you get rid of the wrinkles. Whereas if you don't have a steam iron, you just have the heat, which can help a little bit. But if you iron, for example, wool too hot, it gets shiny and looks worn out and cheap. I also have a tailor's iron. It needs a gravity feed and it's a lot more of a hassle to set it up so I use it less frequently. And overall, I quite enjoy my consumer grade iron because it has two pointed ends so I can iron back and forth without getting creases into my shirts. Now, something that most people underestimate is the ironing board. There are standard ironing boards for $10 and they do the job, but what happens is all that steam just condenses and so your shirts will either be wet and if you really want to get the wrinkles out, it even pays to put them in a plastic bag and spray some water into it and let them sit for about 15 minutes. And that way, all the wrinkles will come out and it's very easy to iron them. Of course, with all that moisture, it will sometimes take a while to get the shirts dry. And so what the pros go for and the alterations tailors and the tailors is a professional ironing board that has a vacuum motor at the bottom of it that sucks out the moist air. And that way you release the wrinkles, but you iron much, much faster. So when in doubt, I'd go with an inexpensive iron and an inexpensive ironing board rather than the other way around. I've tested several machines, the ones with the water tanks, and ultimately I always came back to the simple ones because I invested in the ironing board with the suction engine. If you can make that investment, there are also less expensive options out there on the market, and you can find out more about that in our article on the website here. Item number four is a garment steamer. And even though you can use a regular iron that has a steam button to get some steam out of it, it's very little compared to a designated garment steamer. And I use a garment steamer, especially when I change seasons, when I go from fall, winter to spring, summer and vice versa, because it helps to release wrinkles and it also freshens up garments without having to bring them to the dry cleaner. You don't have space for a steamer or if you're traveling, what I suggest to do is take your clothes, put them in the bathroom, turn on the hot water, let it go so you create a lot of steam and steam your garments that way. It takes a lot longer and it's a lot less efficient, but if that's your only way, that's a good way to release wrinkles. Of course, there are lots of different models out there. I suggest you have something with a long handle and a hose so you can move around easily around the garment without being constricted. The fifth item to invest in are clothes brushes, and they work particularly well in conjunction with steam. What they do is they release dirt and they help to keep the integrity of your garment. If you brush regularly, your garments will last longer because there's less dirt, so moths will get to it less easily. And overall, with a clothes brush, you want something that is not too stiff and not too soft because for your garments, it really has to get under it, but you don't want to damage them. This, for example, would be too soft. For a cashmere garment, that's very fine. You can get something that's a little softer and you can do that by taking bristles that are a little longer. If you have a coarser garment, like a tweed, you can get a brush that has bristles that are a little shorter. Personally, I prefer brushes that are made by hand with natural bristles such as horsehair or boar hair that won't come out. And you may wonder, why do I not use a lint roller? Because that seems to be the golden standard these days. In my opinion, a lint roller is the worst thing you could use on a garment because it pulls out fibers. So you're more likely to experience pilling, especially on sweaters versus with a brush, you don't have that effect. Also, a lint roller is something that's disposable. So you have to keep buying it and keep buying it versus a clothes brush, which is a one-time investment that should last you for a lifetime if it's not machine made, but handmade. On top of that, lint roller only get the stuff that's on the surface, whereas a garment brush can really get the dust out of the entire fabric. 
five is shoes accessories. The first thing you want is a shoehorn, simply because it helps to protect the cap of your shoe when you put them on and maybe even when you take them off because that's something that you cannot repair. And even if you buy a quality pair of shoes, if you put it on without the shoehorn, you'll damage it and it will wear out prematurely and it's hard or impossible to repair. Another item you should invest in is shoe trees. I know it can be expensive and at first it might not seem like a great investment because you can't wear it and no one will ever see it, but in my experience, a wooden pair of shoe trees helps to elongate the lifespan of your shoes tremendously. Basically, once a shoe is worn, there's a lot of moisture in your shoe and because you roll when you walk, you get creases on the uppers, especially below the vamp. Now, a shoe tree helps to bring your shoe back in the original shape, it prevents wrinkles, and it helps to release moisture from it. In my opinion, a proper pair of shoe trees can probably double, maybe even triple the lifespan of your shoes. Most models in plastic have a little ball in the back and kind of a coil, and while that's okay, it's not always perfect for the shoe, and sometimes it's too narrow or too wide, and so that's not ideal. In my opinion, the better version is one with an adjustable coil that helps to stretch your shoe that has wood and maybe some gaps to release the moisture, although that's not quite necessary. But you want something that's round in the back and not too pointy so your heel cap won't be damaged. For that reason, I suggest not to go with these kind of shoe trees because the back is too small and you're more likely to damage your heel cap with that. Premium version for ready to wear shoes or made to order shoes are the ones with a double coil and something that adjusts on the outside. You can see here there's actually leather there. I had them adjusted at a local cobbler just so they fit the shape of that particular pair of shoes which is best because then they stay in shape the longest. Of course, if you have a bespoke or a custom-made pair of shoes, you should get the original shoe trees with it that mirror the last, because that's really the best thing you can do. Sometimes they're also with a hole that's hand-carved, such as with, I think, St. Crispin's. That is a nice detail, but not necessary. In terms of wood, you can go with something lightweight for travel, such as papler, or sometimes people go with cedar for the smell. In my opinion, it doesn't really matter that much as long as it's wood. A shoe shine kit comes in handy because it's a place where you can store all your shoe polish, your cloths, your brushes, and everything that you need. And cleaning your shoes and probably maintaining them definitely helps to make them look good and last long. Item number six is garment bags. This is ideal if you transition your wardrobe in and out and you wanna store it away, but protecting it at the same time. For storage purposes, I found that cotton is ideal because it's breathable and it protects the garment from dust and that's basically all you need. On the other hand, for travel, cotton can be quite heavy and so I stick with these super lightweight, I think polyester or nylon garment bags that don't add any weight to my suitcase, but they really protect my suits and my jackets from getting wrinkled. And sometimes I even have two or three in my suitcase folded and it really helps to keep your items protected. Seven, off-season storage. It's very tempting to leave your entire wardrobe in your closet or where it's easily reachable all year round, but in reality, you will only access a limited amount of clothes at a time. So ideally, if the season changes, you should move what you're not wearing anymore someplace else, because that way you see everything you have for the season and it's easier to put together outfits. And then it's also fun to go through your garments to know what you have when the new season arrives. For example, things like your overcoats should be covered during the summer because they won't get very dusty. And so they're in great shape when they come out of the clothes bag in September or October. Eight, find good maintenance services. And with that, I mean people like menders or maybe a neighborhood lady who's very good at sewing or patching because eventually things will go wrong, you'll wear something out, you'll have a stain that won't come out of the dry cleaner and having someone who can help you with that is really essential and you don't wanna miss that. 
Unfortunately, in the US these days, it's very hard to find these skilled people. In Europe, in Italy, or Germany, it's still easier in my experience. But even in the US, you can find them. Check out Craigslist, check out local listings, and try to develop a relationship with them, because that way, they'll help you very quickly, even if you're in a very tight timeline. Nine is the alterations tailor. No matter if you mostly have custom garments or if you buy everything off the rack or vintage, the alterations tailor should be a man's best friend. Why? Simply because there's not a single thing off the rack that will fit you perfectly because you're a human being and as such you're asymmetrical versus normal off the rack garments are symmetrical. So because of that, there will always need to be some tweaks and a skilled alterations tailor that can shorten the sleeve from the top on the shoulder without ruining the look of it um, is really helpful and really irreplaceable. If you buy a vintage jacket for 20 bucks with sleeves that have surgeon cuffs, and if that's the case, you can't shorten it from the bottom because otherwise the proportions are off. 10, check for a good tri cleaner. I know dry cleaners are around in many places, but most of them are just focused on price and volume. In my experience, that's not great for a handmade jacket or a handmade shirt. Rather, you wanna look for quality and pay a little extra, but get someone who really understands and appreciates your garment and doesn't just iron it with a machine so you get wrinkles and a lot of heavy starch because that's just not the good way to maintain the shirt and chances that buttons will pop up or seams will come undone are much increased with a cheap dry cleaner. So when looking for a dry cleaner, you wanna look for someone who cleans on site, who offers hand ironing, and I found that if they offer museum quality dry cleaning, which is usually something only done for wedding dresses or items that go into a museum, their general knowledge of dry cleaning and their spectrum is much broader, and they usually focus more on quality than on volume. Of course, you'll also pay more, but it's gonna be worth it for your expensive garments. If you wear hats, you definitely wanna check out if you have a local hat blocker, because they can exchange the ribbon, but more importantly, they can reshape your head. They can stretch a hat if it has shrunk, but um, if that's not the case, I suggest you get a hat stretcher. They're adjustable and I personally have a long oval head, so I always get them to make sure my hats don't get round, which they have a natural tendency to do, but they have more in the shape of my head. And that's a good alternative for a head blocker if you can't reach them. I would suggest to check your yellow pages or search online. They're not always the most modern people who do that. So they may not have a website, they may not be listed in Google, but look around here locally, I found one at a dry cleaner. They don't advertise it heavily, but they have these beautiful old hat ribbons that I sometimes put on hats, and it's just fun to have a local resource that can help me with my hats. For example, they can also put in new sweatbands if they're worn out, or I put in a cloth band in a Panama hat because I didn't want it leather. If you enjoyed this video, please sign up to our email newsletter. We have lots more videos related to garment maintenance and garments in general. I'm sure you'll enjoy them and stay tuned for next time. Thank <laughs> you.